so our next session will be uh, by Professor Raghavendra Gupta of IIT Guwahati. He is a faculty in the Chemical Engineering Department of uh, IIT Guwahati, and the session will be uh, on turbulent flows. So over to you, Professor Raghavendra. Thank you, Payal, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I will uh, try to discuss uh, the basic features of turbulent flows and uh, and some glimpses of how how the turbulent flows are modeled or what are the problems in modeling turbulent flows and how those problems are are tackled so so to start with uh, uh, i have a picture here of a turbulent flow behind a boat wake so when you are riding a boat and and you see that uh, the, the wakes are being left behind and and the flow is generally turbulent right so all of us have seen turbulent flows uh, around us most of the flows that are occurring in industry until it is micro scale flow micro scale flows they are turbulent in nature and and the first thing probably we we use or first parameter we use to uh, to identify if the flow is uh, turbulent or uh, all laminar uh, we we look at the reynolds number so for example all of us would have studied in undergraduate that that the flow is becoming or flow becomes turbulent uh, in general for a pipe flow at about reynolds number 2000 2100 2300 for for uh, boundary layer on a flat plate when we talk about so uh, so the typical value when this transition for laminar to turbulent occurs it's about 5 into 10 raised to the power 5 or for flow over a sphere uh, the reynolds number is of about 3 into 10 raised to the power 5 now these are just typical values but but depending on how smooth the surface on which the flow is happening and and how calm the environment is for example the pump from which the flow is happening the surroundings etc then these transition reynolds number has, can change and people have shown that the flow can be laminar in a pipe flow for a Reynolds number for a very high Reynolds number of the order of 10 this to the power 5 even when when they have taken special care that there are no disturbances present in uh, in the surroundings so how do we characterize that the flow is turbulent so turbulent as the name suggests the turbulent flows are characterized by the random three dimensional fluctuations so the randomness uh, edge that as the name suggests that when you say turbulent or not necessarily with respect to the flows when you use the term turbulent it might mean chaos or randomness so so the same is true with turbulent flows that they are characterized by the random uh, fluctuations in the flow and these fluctuations are generally three dimensional so so the fluctuations in what the fluctuations in velocity and pressure so for example if if you measure the velocity at a particular point in a turbulent flow you are going to get a, a velocity like this where uh, you can see that uh, the flow is not necessarily periodic uh, so so turbulent flows are not generally periodic the the behavior is uh, completely random so randomness is what defines turbulence and then you have three dimensional fluctuations and and we all know that laminar flow where uh, the name itself suggests the flow occurs in laminage which means in parallel layers whereas turbulent flows where the flow can occur across the laminage so uh, and and in laminar flow as the reynolds number is the ratio of inertial forces and viscous forces so lower the reynolds number that means dominant the viscous forces are so at low reynolds number viscous forces uh, are dominant and the flow is laminar because the fluctuations that occur in turbulent flow are because of inertia they die down because of the viscous effects 
But when inertial effects become dominant and the Reynolds number become high, then, uh, then it is not possible that, that all the fluctuations die down and you see uh, the flow to be turbulent characterized by random fluctuations. Okay. So uh, there's another picture of turbulent flows which, which we all see uh, the smoke, uh, say for example, the smoke from a incense stick. So the turbulence is characterized by randomness, then diffusivity. So for example, I am a chemical engineer and uh, we, we are concerned with uh, oftentimes with mixing. We want to uh, do reactions in a reactor and in order that to happen, two reactants need to be mixed first. So that mixing occurs or it can occur because of diffusion. Now diffusion can happen because of molecular diffusion. So molecular diffusion is that the molecules are uh, uh, moving around randomly, but this diffusion is very slow, especially in liquids. So uh, in turbulent flows, because there are a lot of uh, vortices, a lot of eddies, and these eddies can range from a uh, from the smallest scale to a large number uh, to, to a very large scale. So the largest scale can be uh, the scale of your problem. So for example, if you are considering the flow in a room, the largest scale can be uh, the, the dimension of the room itself and the smallest scale, what we call Kolmogorov length scale. So, or, or the scales at which these, uh, uh, the, the fluctuations are dissipated by the viscous motion. So, so another very important property of turbulent flow is diffusivity, which can be used, for example, if you want to do heat transfer, not only reactions, but if you want to do heat transfer, you get a lot of mixing because of the inherent diffusivity present in, uh, in turbulent flows. Of course, they are characterized by the large Reynolds number. And as I said earlier, that the large Reynolds number means that the viscous effects are not uh, uh, so important or are dominated by the inertial effects. Then you have three-dimensional vorticity fluctuations. So, so it suggests that in turbulent flows, the vorticity effect or the vortices are present and these vortices, uh, the, there are fluctuations in vorticity and these vortices are three-dimensional. So turbulent flow is three-dimensional in nature. And uh, then the energy that is present because the, there are fluctuations in turbulent flow and these fluctuations, they eventually need to die or they eventually die down. So, so there has to be a continuous source of energy, which, uh, which causes the fluctuations in the flow and, uh, and these fluctuations cascading happens. So, so these fluctuations uh, move or, or the energy in the fluctuations is transferred from the largest scale, largest length scale to the smallest length scale. So that happens and it is called energy cascading. And that the smallest length scale, because as the scale becomes smaller and smaller, viscous effect can become important. So the small, at the smallest length scale, the energy is dissipated uh, by the viscous effects and this energy is converted to thermal energy. Now, uh, of course, so, so we said that there are number of uh, scales present in turbulent flows, but even the smallest length scale that is present in turbulent flows, it is the smallest length scale is bigger than the molecular length scale. So, so we can treat the flow to be continuum. I hope that everybody knows what is continuum because uh, when we model fluid flow, the entire structure that you are modeling in open form, you solve uh, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, the, the momentum conservation equation and mass conservation equation. 
Uh, all these are differential equations and you can model a phenomena in uh, using differential equations only when uh, the continuum assumption is valid, only when you can treat the velocity fields to be continuous, density fields to be continuous, pressure fields to be continuous, and that is possible only when the, the length scale of the problem is sufficiently large than a typical length scale which represent the intermolecular distance. In gases, this intermolecular distance can be uh, a mean free path and in liquids, the, the average molecular distance. So, so it is uh, still continuum. Now, these adits can have a wide range of time and length scales. So, so as I said that the, the length scales or the size of the IDs, they will be the largest size that will be limited by the dimension of the system. How big? So if you're talking about the pipe, the, uh, the diameter of the pipe can be your largest eddy size. And uh, then uh, this energy is being transferred from larger eddies to the smaller eddies, which we call energy cascading. And this is this famous quote you, uh, you see in many turbulence books that uh, big worlds, worlds means the vortices, they have little worlds that feed on their velocity and little worlds have lesser worlds and so on to viscosity in the molecular sense. So this represents that there are bigger, uh, bigger vortices from there, the energy or the turbulent kinetic energy is transferred to the smaller vortices and uh, down to uh, the smallest scale where the energy is dissipated by viscosity. So when, when the ADH becomes smaller and at such uh, the smallest scale, the viscous effects are important and this kinetic energy is converted to heat. So, so this gentleman, Kalmo Grove, uh, who, who provided a lot of insight on turbulence by simple uh, dimensional arguments and scaling arguments. So he suggested that uh, the size of the smallest ADG or the length scale, velocity scale, and time scales, all, all the things. So the, so the first size means the length scale of the smallest ADG. So we know from here that the largest ADG can be the size of your system. And then the smallest ADG, he suggested that there can be a universal uh, correlation for the smallest ADG that will depend on the rate of energy dissipation. So energy dissipation, energy means the turbulent kinetic energy, which is basically uh, in terms of fluctuations. So, so the rate of energy dissipation and fluid properties. So which is uh, because the viscous effects will depend on mu and rho, or if you want to write it in terms of kinematic viscosity, then nu, which is mu over rho. So, so by just simply looking at dimensional arguments, the turbulent kinetic energy, which is, I will have the definition in the later slides, but let me just write here. Of sigma u i des squared. So, so turbulent kinetic energy is basically ui, vi, and wi, or u1, u2, u3, they are the fluctuations. So the square of that divided by two, it represents turbulent kinetic energy. So depending on uh, or using turbulent kinetic energy and the rate of this kinetic energy dissipation. So the unit of k is meter square per second square, as you can see from this expression. So it should actually be called a specific turbulent kinetic energy. And epsilon represents the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy per unit time, which is meter square per second square, meter square per second square divided by second. So its unit is meter square per second Q. So you can construct length scale, uh, velocity scale and time scale using 
simple dimension uh, di dimensional arguments or, or, or the uh, Buckingham Pi theorem, which all of you would have studied in your undergraduate course on fluid mechanics. So this gives you an idea about the smallest length scale that is present in turbulent flows. So if you want to model from the modeling perspective, you will need to, because this uh, these scales can give you an idea that what is the smallest length scale, what is the smallest time scale that is going to be present in your flow. So you would like your mess to be smallest possible so that all these length scales are captured. So you can have an idea or you can calculate what L is going to be. Of course, you need to have some idea about what is epsilon, what is K, the fluctuations, etc. If you know that, then you will have an idea that what kind of uh, mass or what size of mass is required. So typically those values will be very small. And that is the reason because as you would have learned that your solution will be as accurate if you are able to capture all the gradients. And to capture all the gradients, your mass needs to be sufficiently small in the regions where uh, the gradients are large. Okay, so, uh, so you need to have a very refined mass plus when you are resolving all the time scale, your time step also needs to be very, very small. And that makes modeling turbulence directly or solving the conservation equations directly using uh, even with today's computational power that is at our disposal, it becomes very difficult to solve these uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equations for turbulent flows accurately so that you can capture all the length and velocity scales and time scales. So, so that is why you need to go or you need to do uh, uh, develop some models which are generally heuristic models. So what is what can be done is one can decompose the velocity in mean and fluctuating components. So as you can see here that the, the velocity, let us say u component of velocity with time, it, it is uh, randomly moving. But one can, if one can average this velocity over a sufficiently long time. So the averaging, the, there are different averaging that can be done. If it is homogeneous turbulence, homogeneous meaning that it is sim same in all directions, then one can even use space averaging. If it is, uh, or, or one can do time averaging. And uh, one can even do the, uh, ensemble averaging by for, for state or ensemble averaging is that averaging over a large number of samples. So, so this averaging is done over a sufficiently long period of time so that your uh, your time average is independent of your t average. So you are going to get if you uh, uh, average over a sufficiently long period of time, then you get a mean velocity, which, which is represented here using U bar. So you can decompose your velocity in terms of U bar and U dash. So U dash is the fluctuating component. So for example, if I look at this particular, uh, at this particular time, this is my U dash or the fluctuating component and you have velocity u bar. Similarly, you can uh, decompose v component of velocity v bar and v dash and, uh, and the z component of velocity w in w bar and w dash. And, uh, and the same can be done for pressure. So, so you can basically decompose the velocity field and pressure field in mean and fluctuating components and it is called Reynolds decomposition. 
Now, this averaging can be done uh, over or should be done over a sufficiently long time in, uh, interval so that the fluctuations are averaged out. So if you average fluctuations or if you write, say, if you average fluctuations, this value is going to be zero because over a long period of time, the sum of fluctuations will be zero from, you can see from this relationship. But this averaging time scale will be sufficiently small from the time scale that is involved in your process. What is your flow time scale? Okay. Now, so, so u bar can still be a function of time. That means your mean velocity in this case can be uh, a time dependent velocity. Sometimes it might be steady, but if, if the, the flow is, if you think that your flow is uh, time dependent, then you can have uh, a mean velocity, which is time dependent plus fluctuations. Okay. Uh, so so as, as I discussed in the previous slide that the fluctuations, they can be represented because if you average fluctuations over time, then you are going to get their value to be zero. So in place of fluctu uh, averaging fluctuations, what is done is uh, you take uh, u dash square plus v dash square plus w dash square. So you, you take there the uh, squares of u dash, v dash, and w dash, and they are represented uh, half of them, half, half of sum of fluctuations or square of fluctuations you call turbulent kinetic energy. Okay. Again, so I would like to emphasize here that the unit of turbulent kinetic energy, even though we call it kinetic energy, the unit is not meter square per second square. So it is basically a specific turbulent kinetic energy or the kinetic energy of the fluctuations per unit uh, density. Now, if you use those decompositions, and write down in the Navier-Stokes equation. So, so if uh, in your Navier-Stokes and uh, continuity equation, if you substitute, for example, your uh, for an incompressible flow, your continuity equation is del dot u is equal to zero. Now, if you substitute in place of u, u bar plus u dash. Then, okay. so uh, so del dot u is equal to zero, and you substitute u by u bar plus u dash, so mean component of velocity and the fluctuating component of velocity. And when you do that for the continuity and momentum equation, what you end up with is so when you uh, average the continuity and momentum equations, you are going to get similar looking equations. Del dot V bar is equal to zero. So it is continuity equation, but now in place of V, you have V bar, which represents the mean velocity. Similarly, you will get a momentum equation where you have uh, the usual uh, acceleration term, this is your uh, time dependent uh, uh, or unsteady term, and then you have convective term, pressure gradient. So, so in all these terms, what you have is mean velocity in place of the velocity, or similarly mean pressure here. Then, then you have viscous, viscous term and, uh, and the body force term. Now, there is one extra term that you end up with, which is this del dot, uh, minus rho V dash V dash. So V dash V dash is uh, basically it represent the fluctuation, fluctuating velocity vectors. So this is an additional term. Now, when you are trying to solve a flow problem for an incompressible isothermal Newtonian flow, you have two unknowns and two equations. Your unknowns are velocity vector and pressure. So you want to solve for velocity field and pressure field, and you have two equations, continuity and momentum equation. Now, when you are 
when you have done the averaging because in general if if you are an engineering student if you are trying to solve some engineering problem even if the flow is turbulent your interest is in the mean flow so if you will be fine if you can find out the mean velocity and mean pressure field now we have been able to convert using reynolds decomposition and then averaging so these equations after averaging they are called reynolds average equations or rans uh, reynolds reynolds averaged navier stokes equation but the problem now is that we have apart from v bar and p bar we have another unknown which is minus rho v dash p dash so we do not know this what is uh, how how we can find out because this is also unknown for us so we have more number of unknowns than uh, than the number of equations so the system of equations is not closed okay so this is generally known as a closure problem of turbulence now if you look at this term rho v dash v dash and so so basically it is rho into v square or rho into velocity into velocity which will give you a unit of uh, pressure or unit of stress so in analogy with this it is called uh, reynolds stress because in a way it it, it is analogous to uh, viscous stresses or, or or the viscous fluctuations or so uh, or the molecular fluctuations so so it in analogy with this it is called stress and um, reynolds stress so or turbulent stress sometimes and you it is a tensor because you have uh, three fluctuating components and you have their product so you can have rho u dash u dash rho u dash v dash rho u dash w dash and so on so you can have nine components and this term represents the fluctuations on the mean flow so if you look at the system of equations what this term is representing that the mean velocity field how is it being affected by the fluctuations that is being represented by this term which we call Reynolds stress, and now our task at hand is to model uh, this Reynolds stress. So now we have uh, additional unknown, rho v dash v dash, and this system of equations, as I said earlier, that it is not closed because we have more unknowns than the equations that are available to us. So this is what is called closure problem of turbulence. and that is why uh, we we need to develop turbulence models which can represent either you can have a transport equation where which which is for reynolds stress or you can represent this reynolds stress in terms of mean flow in its gradient which is what we are going to discuss today so uh so there was one th one one hypothesis or one assumption that was put forward that this reynolds stress in analogy with the uh, molecular uh, or kinetic theory of gases uh, where where we get the concept of molecular viscosity one can represent the reynolds stress tensor in terms of a a viscosity which is called turbulent viscosity or eddy viscosity or turbulent eddy viscosity and the velocity gradients which is say say if you are talking about in xy plane then tau xy or so tau xy here is uh, only reynolds stress so reynolds stress tau xy r is equal to mu t into du by dy so this reynolds stress can be represented as the product of eddy viscosity and mean strain strain rate tensor so when you write this completely then you will get a uh, strain rate tensor which is sij here so if you write this in three dimensions and it is convenient to write in index notations so so i can write this minus rho u i des uh into u j dash is equal to 2 mu t where mu t is the turbulent viscosity into sij where sij is the strain rate tensor 
minus 2 by 3 rho k, where k is the turbulent kinetic energy and delta ij is the chronic or delta which is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and 0 otherwise. Right. So, so, so this represents the complete uh, definition of uh, Bussin's hypothesis that you can represent Reynolds stress in terms of uh, Sij and mu t, and of course this uh, this turbulent kinetic energy. Now, what we have done that. In place of Reynolds stress, we have represented Reynolds stress in terms of a kinetic energy and the gradients of or, or the derivatives uh, along the space of mean velocity. Sij h in terms of mean velocity. So Sij you can write half of. dou ui over dou xj plus dou of uj over dou xi. Okay, so, so that is your strain rate tensor and these are in terms of mean velocity. Now we, we have got rid of, or we can represent the Reynolds stress in terms of mean velocity gradients and turbulent viscosity. But now this turbulent or eddy viscosity, we need to represent in some of the turbulent properties. So this is what, when you represent in terms of turbulent kinetic energy and epsilon, which is, uh, if you remember, it was the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy then it is called k epsilon model. And when it is represented in terms of k and omega, so k is again turbulent kinetic energy and omega is uh, the specific rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. So a specific rate of dissipation here means that the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy divided by turbulent kinetic energy. So the unit of omega h second place to the power minus one. So, so again, we can look at what these three terms mean, k, epsilon, and omega. So k, we have already seen that it is turbulent kinetic energy represented by half u dash square plus v dash square plus w dash square, where u dash, v dash, w dash are fluctuations, and the unit is meter square per second square. Epsilon, which is rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy per unit mass. So, so the unit will be turbulent kinetic energy per unit time, which is meter square uh, second raised to the power minus three. Now this epsilon is can be represented by this expression where nu is the molecular kinematic viscosity or mu over rho multiplied by gradients of uh, fluctuation. So do u i dash by dou x k. So this represents, this term represents the dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. And remember this dissipation happens because of the molecular viscosity. So that is why we have nu in front of uh, this term. Now, omega, which is called uh, a specific dissipation rate or dissipation rate per unit turbulent kinetic energy. So when you divide this uh, turbulent kinetic energy dissipation, divide by turbulent kinetic energy, then you are going to get second inverse as your unit. Okay. So, so you can say that this omega also represents uh, some mean frequency of turbulence. Probably that is why it is given this uh, the symbol uh, to represent that because uh, omega, which is generally used to represent some frequency or second inverse. It can also be thought of a, uh, a kind of one over omega can be a time scale. And this is the time scale at which dissipation of K occurs. Or 
it can be th also thought of the rate of dissipation because this rate of dissipation is happening from the larger stages to smaller stages. So this is rate of transfer of turbulent kinetic energy to the smallest edge. Okay. So, so then uh, there are different models. Now, uh, this turbulent kinetic energy, uh, sorry, it, if you go back, what we have done is we have represented the Reynolds stress in terms of turbulent viscosity and mean strain rate tensor. Now, we need to represent mu t or we need to find out mu t because unlike molecular viscosity, it is not property of the fluid. It is property of the flow and flow means it is property of the turbulent flow. So it depends on the turbulent kinetic energy and some representation of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. So in K epsilon model, we have this that we can uh, write mu t in terms of K and epsilon and of course rho. So if you do a dimensional analysis, you can easily see that mu t will be rho K square by epsilon. So you get turbulent kinetic energy is proportional to rho k square by epsilon and then you put a constant uh, together so then you have equality sign that mu t is equal to rho c mu k squared by epsilon. Now how do we find out k and epsilon? Initially when your flow is entering probably you know what you have some idea about what kind of fluctuations are present or what, what is the turbulent intensity. So you can put in some values of K and epsilon. And then how this K and epsilon is being transported. People have developed uh, or one can derive the transport equations for K and epsilon directly from Navier-Stokes equation taking its different momentum. But then again, you will have some unknowns, so which needs to be closed. So to cut matter short, what one can do is, uh, or people have developed uh, different transport equations for K and epsilon for the transport of turbulent kinetic energy and turbulent rate of uh, or uh, dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. So the first equation is for K. And if you look at the first or the left hand side is exactly what you see for your say uh, moment on uh, the transfer of energy or, or specific enthalpy or the transfer of for, or the transport of momentum or transport of uh, concentration. So, so that is your material derivative term. This term basically represents the diffusion of turbulent kinetic energy. So what you see here, apart from mu, mu is basically which represent the diffusion of turbulent kinetic energy because of molecular transport and mu t over sigma k, it represents the diffusion of turbulent kinetic energy because of the turbulent fluctuations. Then you have uh, another term pk, which represents the production of turbulent kinetic energy and rho epsilon represents the dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. Now this p term pk, basically it is uh, it comes from the interaction of the fluctuations so you see the fluctuations which is basically reynolds stress multiplied by the uh, mean strain rate tensor so this as we saw our hypothesis so it can be represented as mu t s square so so you have both of these can come as source term in your system of equations so basically a, a material derivative term or a transient term and convective term, diffusive term, and then you have a source term. Similarly, you have a transport of epsilon. 
So epsilon basically represent the rate of dissipation of uh, turbulent kinetic energy. Again, you have uh, unsteady term, then, then you have convective term, diffusive term, and then production of dissipation and dissipation of dissipation. So, so basically, uh, to cut matters short, what you can say, there is a transport equation for K, there is a transport equation for epsilon. And uh, so, so this K epsilon equation is generally useful or it can model correctly the free shear layer, free shear layer flow. So you have aware where, where there are no wall bounded flows. Uh, and the other condition is that pressure gradients are relatively small. It, it does not perform so well for wall bounded and internal flows, except when mean pressure gradients of flow are small. And, and it does not perform well in any case when there are large adverse pressure gradients. So one need to know that what are the limitations of the model. Then there is another model which is called K omega model. So using same dimensionless arguments, one can write mu t in terms of K and omega, so rho K by omega. And then again, a transport equation for K and a transport equation for omega. You have all these three terms, same, unsteady, convective, and diffusive, and then production of turbulent kinetic energy and dissipation. SK basically represents that if there is some generation of turbulent kinetic energy and you may or may not have it. Okay. So, so this uh, K omega model is generally uh, found to be quite accurate uh, for wall bounded flows where, where you will have boundary layers. So it is very accurate, accurate for uh, boundary layers and the pressure gradients, they might be favorable or adverse, but it has problem or it is sensitive to free stream boundary conditions. So, so you have K epsilon model, which is good in free shear flows, whereas uh, the K omega model, which, which is good in near wall flows. So what people have done, they have done blending of the two that if it is near wall then uh, then one can use k omega model and if it is in the uh, in the free stream then one can use uh, k epsilon model so again the, uh, the hybrid of two or the models which are hybrid of two have come up and there are a number of variations of these two equation models they are used they they have become over time workhorse for uh, uh, for turbulent flow modeling, especially in industry, of course, apart from that, you have LES and DNS models. So when you, when it comes to near wall, near the wall, if you look at the velocity profile for turbulent flows in general, it might be internal flow or external flow. This is the typical velocity profile or what you have that uh, near the wall, what you have on the x-axis is a non-dimensional term, which is kind of a Reynolds number, it's, and is called y plus, so y u tau over nu, where u tau is basically uh, a, a velocity, which is represented in terms of tau w over mu squared root, and it is called friction velocity, so y u tau over nu, nu is the kinematic viscosity. And at the uh, y scale, you have u plus, so mean velocity divided by this friction velocity. So the viscous sublayer, where the viscous effects near the wall, viscous effects become important. And then uh, uh, at the center, your uh, velocity profile, what is there for the in the outermost layer, whatever profile you had. So this is from for a pi flow, so that is why a power law pro profile and you pi flow, you might know that one seventh power law is typically used. And then you have a buffer layer or overlap layer where uh, which which is basically connecting to that that the transition happens. So when you want uh, one need to take into account that what is going to happen at the viscous sub layer, and then two approaches because if you look at K epsilon model, it is it is not so good near the walls, uh, and 
and and k omega model can can model accurately all the way down to the wall so there are different near wall treatment approaches that are used so uh, two approaches two different approaches one is that different wall functions have been developed so in such cases the viscous sublayer and buffer regions are not resolved so that means your mass is not defined near the wall it is such that that the y plus value is more than 30 so you are not modeling this viscous sublayer and overlap layer uh, uh, and in place of model a a velocity profile is provided at the wall using so and these functions are called uh, wall functions another approach is near wall model approach so where you take care that you are modeling the near wall region so that you are actually your mass is sufficiently refined so your y plus is, is, is of the order of one so so if you take the first uh, cell height which as y and you calculate y plus then your y plus should be one or so or, or even less than that so that you will be able to capture viscous sublayer and buffer layer or overlap layer in your modeling so one need to take into account that what kind of uh, near wall treatment you are using in your simulations so uh, if i summarize uh, that what is done in turbulence modeling especially or i i have only talked about two equation models here so one can decompose the velocity using rain uh, reynolds decomposition in a mean and a fluctuating velocity component and then uh, one can average the equations uh, the reynolds average uh, averaging and then it this averaging can be over time space or ensemble averaging so by averaging you get what you get is reynolds average heavier strokes or ranas equations and this gives an additional term in momentum equation which is called reynolds stress and and this reynolds stress needs to be represented in terms of turbulent properties of the flow and the mean velocity so so this is done using uh, bosinis hypothesis where reynolds stress is represented in terms of eddy viscosity and and strain rate of mean velocity or mean strain rate then uh, then what do you need to do you need to represent eddy viscosity in terms of turbulent properties and when you take k and epsilon as turbulent properties then you call it k epsilon model when you take k and omega at turb h turbulent properties then you call it k omega model so uh, then then for you need to solve transport equations for k and epsilon in in the in in k epsilon model and transport equations for k and omega in k omega model so i think that is what uh, i had uh, and hopefully uh, it helped so i will be happy to answer questions if you have any so can you explain Bosinic's hypothesis? So uh, Bosinic's hypothesis is basically, so if you look at what is this tau x, y, h, uh, it, it's, I have just represented it in terms of tau, it is Reynolds stress. So when you represent Reynolds, you remember Newton's law of viscosity, which tells that uh, the shear stress is equal to viscosity or dynamic viscosity multiplied by gradient of velocity right so along the same lines what is done is reynolds stress tensor or or, or the reynolds stress is represented as multiplication or the product of mu t which is turbulent viscosity and the gradient of mean velocity so du by dy multiplied by a viscosity or, or a viscosity like term which represents the turbulent diffusion right so that is what is called business hypothesis or business assumption so 
sir turbulent viscosity we can say turbulent viscosity is a volumetric viscosity because turbulent effect is a uh, volumetric effect or three dimensional effect yeah so it is three dimensional effect but uh, what, what do you mean by volumetric viscosity volumetric viscosity means uh, it affects the volume of the uh, infinitesimal element uh, like uh, when we say uh, dynamic viscosity uh, it is only related to the uh, what is the moment transferred from first layer to second layer or layer to layer but when we say volumetric viscosity it refers to uh, volumetric effect on the elements probably you could say so but i think even if you talk about molecular viscosity you you can have uh, say a viscosity which is non isotropic then you will have layers along x direction layers along y direction so there also molecular viscosity uh, will be similar so turbulent viscosity is actually a uh, a flow property and it is just uh, that that one need to represent it in some terms uh, some terms of turbulent property so you represent in terms of k and epsilon so i would not divulge too much into that it is a surface phenomena and it is a uh, volumetric phenomena because ultimately what you again said that it is it is an infinitesimal volume so so i don't yes. see any uh, any merit that how we can uh, i mean benefit by saying it uh, volumetric viscosity okay sir uh, could you explain the near wall turbulence modeling like why y plus has to be one i i did not understand that right so uh, basically there can be two approaches one is i mean there, there are two approaches that are being used one is what is called wall function approach so wall function approach means that you you see this velocity this is this graph represents the velocity profile near the wall now you have viscous layer and overlap layer where the viscous effects are important and then outer layer where the viscous effects are not so important so one can model this one can do first approach in the first approach one can have his or her the first element size so big that all this is coming into first cell so the your, your cell is first cell is somewhere here so that your y plus is greater than 30 that means viscous sub layer and overlap layer you are not modeling and in place of modeling you suggest that there is because this is an universal uh, law so so one can use wall functions or one can input in your model you can code such that a velocity profile is defined at the wall in this cell okay so that is your wall function approach now if you want to resolve you no know, you want to model it then you need to have uh, your mass so refined that you can capture you can resolve a viscous sublayer if there are no wall functions wall functions built in in your mathematical model then you need to refine your grid such that you can capture this phenomena because if your uh, mass is such uh, so big let us say if in in near wall model approach if your mass or first cell height is like this then you will not be able to resolve viscous sublayer you are not going to find out the gradients in the viscous sublayer and then overlap layer where the gradients or where you have a log log law coming into picture so in order to resolve that you in order to capture those gradients your mass should be sufficiently refined so your mass should be refined so if you look at i think somewhere uh, that that y plus is equal to 5 is where you have a uh, viscous sublayer so if you want to resolve this viscous sublayer then you should have few elements so typically uh, say five six elements if you have there then you will be able to resolve viscous sublayer so that is why i said i said that you should have y plus is equal to 1 if if you want to model uh, or if you want to 
capture the phenomena using your simulations. Of course, it depends on what model you are using or what is built in the code which you are using for near wall treatment. So probably take home message is that when you are modeling turbulent flow, you need to look at that how the near wall uh, uh, treatment is being done in the mathematical model or or the turbulent model that you are using. I hope this answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And one more follow-up question. So then the, if the first uh, uh, cell, like if it is very refined, uh, is there any restriction on the uh, like upper cell, the second, third? Can it be bigger? Like Yeah, you, uh, can, you can change, but, but you should change it gradually. So typically you will take uh, the the ratio of first cell height and second cell height say say about 1.1 or 1.2 so because gradually you will uh, change this uh, so so there are not sudden changes and of course uh, if you are capturing and then uh, first cell height is y plus is equal to one and then second cell is quite big then again you will have only two cells in the viscous sublayer so typically you change you start increasing the size but at the same time, make sure that you have three, four or five cells so that you capture the viscous sublayer. Of course, the viscous sublayer, I think if you look at the profile, it is U plus is equal to Y plus. Okay, so, so it is almost linear velocity profile. It does not appear to be linear here because this is log log scale. Right. Again, when you go to overlap layer, it is logarithmic phenomena. So again, the gradients are going to be large. So again, you should have sufficiently uh, sufficient resolution in this region also, so that you are capturing the uh, the gradient here. Because the way you capture, or, or the, if if these uh, the profile here is captured accurately, then only probably you will have uh, the mean flow profile and mean flow properties captured correctly. Sir, uh, in open form, this near wall uh, modeling is dependent on the solver or grid size it will depend on i i am not sure actually because i i don't use open form heavily so i am also a learner of open form like you guys and i have not done any turbulence modeling uh using open form so probably i will not be able to answer that question i will have to look at their help and then see so what you could do you can look at uh, the literature where where they have modeled uh, k epsilon or k omega or any other model and see what is the near wall treatment okay thank you sir sir in k epsilon model uh initially in open form we are supposed to initialize uh, some random value mm -hmm. for k and epsilon mm -hmm. so it's a function of velocity so mm -hmm. when there is inlet and outlet uh we can assume some uh, velocity but uh there might be some cases where where there is no inlet and outlet like we are just simulating a domain so mm -hmm. in that case how to uh, initialize this uh, k and uh, epsilon uh, value yeah so uh, you can use the same thing what you are using when there is inlet and outlet right even if you have inlet and outlet you need to initialize the k and epsilon values in the entire domain right so so generally uh, uh, epsilon can be represented in terms of turbulent length scale. So, uh, and 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 from the turbulent length scale, you can uh, you can represent turbulent length scale in terms of k and epsilon. So, k typically you can take three to five percent uh, the fluctuations or fluctuating velocity is typically you can initially assume that it is three to five percent of your flow so from that you can calculate the initial turbulent kinetic energy and then you have a length scale of your problem so from length scale you can calculate what is the value of epsilon and that value you can use your initial guess as well as the value at the at the inlet boundary because you will also need to define k and epsilon as your Inlet, at your inlet boundary. I think uh, CFD online also have uh, some calculator where one can use or one one can input some parameters for the flow that you are solving and it 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 calculates for you what what is the value of k and epsilon. Of course, some similar formulas are built up there. 
yes sir but that is for uh, some in inlet and outlet boundary conditions but i am asking like when there is no yeah inlet. so you can use the because it is it is just an assumption that what uh, ideally you should know what is the value of k and epsilon in your flow initially but then we do not know so and, and same same thing stands for uh, for the inlet values for k and epsilon so you can use the same thing for your flow and uh, depending on how it evolves because what what you are going to get that with time how the value of k and epsilon are going to change so eventually you should be able to get from your equations how the values are changing until you you introduce a lot of turbulence then 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 that may cause problems so you start with say very low turbulence and see how it grows yes sir sometimes what happens sir uh, we uh, initialize random values mm -hmm. and what what we notice like uh, the solution is not getting converged yeah so my suggestion will be you start with say typically uh, 3 to 5% fluctuations and okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, if the velocity profile is linear in viscous sublayer, so why we need more number of grid points? We can use one grid point at a y plus is equal. I mean, y is equal to zero, and another grid point at y plus is equal to five. Now, well, you can try doing that, and then you can have uh, you you make sure that you have uh, that you have sufficient grid points in the overlap layer because the grid velocity profile is exponential there you can have two two elements here and then you can have uh, more more elements in the overlap layer okay sir okay so if there are no further questions i think we can close the session uh, thank you so much professor raghavendra thank it you. was a very informative session and uh, many students were uh, uh, questioning you and you have been constantly answering them so thanks a lot thank you it's a pleasure to thank you thank you